Uh, hey, my name is Gene Kim. Um, I am going to be giving the last session, so I want to make sure that I'm very disciplined about uh, hitting the time mark. So uh, what I'd like to do in the next 55 minutes is share with you what has been a now going on 15-year journey studying high-performing IT operations and security and dev organizations. And this initially started when I was the CTO and founder of a company called Tripwire, where it was initially in 1999, we called it Geniuses of People with Great Kung Fu. So these were organizations that talked differently, acted differently, but more importantly, they had profoundly different results than your typical IT organization. They had great project due date performance, they had great operations reliability and stability and re availability. They had great security. They had great postures of compliance. And so really the goal was how do we kind of understand what made them great and document how they made their good to great transformation so others could replicate the transformation. And so the kind of the most surprising part of that journey for me is that it took me straight into the heart of the DevOps movement, which I think is incredibly transformative. That happens once every 30 years, and it has such a huge impact to security practitioners. And I think one of, for me, one of the most memorable things that's happened in the last five years is watching Alex Smolin, Neil Matadal, and uh, Justin Collins give a pres presentation at the AppSec USA um, conference talking about how InfoSec works within the dev and ops teams at Twitter. And you know, I my fondest hopes is that by the end of this presentation, you'll agree that, yeah, th in some ways, they have sort of transcended the mortal plane, right? And now we are experiencing life in a way that we all wish you know, we could, and it's within our grasp. So with that, um, let me just share with you why I think DevOps is so important, not just for Info InfoSec, but for Dev and Ops. And it's because there's a downward spiral that happens in almost every organization. And it always can be told in two acts. The first act is always begins in operations. Um, so when, how many people here have done time as a sysadmin in ops uh, or as a DBA or a network engineer, right? And so when you're in ops, right, you know, our goal is to keep systems running so that, you know, we can create, you know, a reliable service for the customer and that's how we deliver value. The problem is so much of our life is trying to keep things running that are fragile, right? And the reason why we call them fragile is that every time we touch it, it blows up, causes an unplanned outage, you know, catastrophic amount of rework, no one knows how to build a new one, um, and, you know, uh, and, you know, God forbid we actually need to patch that, right? Um, so the tragedy is that where you find the most fragile artifacts is typically in one of two places. They're in the most critical uh, operations of the organization, you know, maybe the most critical revenue generating infrastructure of the company, or it's in the most critical initiative, right? The most critical project that's meant to close the gap with the competition, you know, bring new capabilities to market. And so when you find fragile artifacts in those two places, in the most critical project, in the most critical operations, right, something inevitable occurs, which is that the organization ceases to become able to you know, meet the promises that it makes to the outside world, right? Whether it's features we deliver to customers, whether it's um, you know, uh, earnings per share estimates that we promise to Wall Street, or whether it's you know, trying to show analysts that uh, we can have a viable strategy and can actually execute. And so speaking as a married person, I can say with uh, you know, moral conviction, right, with moral certainty, that you know, when we break promises to someone else, you know, we tend to overcompensate by making bigger, larger, even more audacious promises that we're even less likely to hit in the future, right? And so you know, that's part of human nature. That's neither good nor bad. The problem is organizations do this too, right? And so the problem is not that, right? The problem is who's making the promises. It's these people, the product managers, you know, the product owners, you know, who are often art majors, creative writing majors, poetry majors even. <laughs> And, um, you know, let me just put the rest, right? Some of my best friends are poetry majors. The point is that they're often making large decisions based on uh, maybe not the biggest, best grasp of what technology can and can't do, right? And so uh, they make a commitment to the outside world where uh, a commitment has now been made, right? And so now enter the developers. What we now see are urgent, date-driven projects put into the queue, right, where a commitment has already been made, right? So, uh, you know, we can't move the date. And by the way, to explain this joke, you know, of course in operations, um, you know, to all you developers out there, um, you know, we have a joke, right? Show me a developer who's not causing an outage, you know, I'm sh you know I'll show you one who's on vacation, right? So, but clearly now that, um, you know, I, I'm, all my friends are in the DevOps community, we can't say that. Uh, it's all about the DBAs. You know, incidentally, one of the, my favorite jokes I've ever heard in ops um, is, you know, was this. They said, our fewest number of recorded SEV1 incidents in our history was uh, during Oracle World, right? Uh, and basically, every DBA was uh, in San Francisco getting trained on whatever. But the week after, we had the highest recorded number of SEV1 incidents. Why? Because they were all putting everything that they had learned in production, right? So anyway, so as a development community, what we now see are you know, a 
date driven project. And so we have to cut every corner that needs to, that can be cut in order to hit the date. So that means you know uh, that means testing, security testing, capacity testing, deployment, uh, manageability, so forth, right? All the non functional requirements. And that means you know at the end of each project we have one more fragile piece of artifact in production, right? And so that's another downward spiral. And so Ward Cunningham uh, said it best 15 years ago, right? Technical debt is what we feel the next time we try to make a change. So when I visualize technical debt, I view it like this, right? It is the accumulation of all the crap in the data center downstream, right? That accrue over decades, where you know each with a promise, you know, that we're going to fix it when we have a little bit more time, right? So you know, technical debt is like financial debt uh, in that it compounds, right? And so this, although bad, is not as bad as this, right? And so this is actually very bad for availability and also security, right? Um, because suppose you have an outage and you even know it's due to a cabling error, right? You know, which cable is it? It's that cable, right? But don't jiggle the cable because we know somewhere in that wiring cabinet, right? You know, there's a loose cable, and if you touch the wrong one, right, the entire site will go down, right? Uh, like you know, two years ago. So, uh, but you know, so that's certainly another you know downward spiral. But there's actually something far more insidious that happens, which is that deployments start taking longer. So think of a friend, right, who you know had an application that used to take five minutes to deploy. So it's taking 10 minutes, so it's taking an hour, so it's taking a day, so it's taking two days, right? And so two days, I think, is a threshold between sort of bad and intolerable. Because at least, you know, if you're not Twitter, right? You know, in most uh, enterprises, you know, if you have to do an upgrade and you just have to make sure it's open by 5 a.m. Pacific time, right? You can do it as long as you have the ops guys, you know, start at 5.01 p.m., right? And work all night, you know, throughout the entire weekend. But when it starts taking three days, right? Now, in general, now it takes heroics on everybody's part in order to finish the deploy, right? The DBAs, the network engineers, security engineers and so forth. So uh, what ends up happening is that you know, it doesn't stop at three days. It takes a week, two weeks. The worst uh, deployment I've ever seen uh, was one that took six weeks to deploy. So that took about 1,300 manual, very error-prone steps. Right? Uh, this is for a $6 billion a year revenue-generating application. And so at this point, something terrible happens. Right? This is the conditions that cause the intertribal warfare between operations and development, right? So here's our friendly developer checking in code, right? They high-five each other in the parking lot, right? Go to the bar and buy drinks for everybody, not realizing that they set the entire data center on fire, right? And oh, by the way, we accidentally left logging turned on, and now we have card holder data in the log files, right? <laughs> you know, what could go wrong? And so, um, you know, what happens here is that, you know, when deployments start taking longer, right? Something, at this point, no one's achieving their goals. Features are not getting quickly into market. Deployments are starting to take longer. You know, we have an ever-increasing number of 7-1 outages, right? And we have an ever-increasing number of, you know, uh, firefighting and operations. And we're unable, increasingly unable to pay down technical debt, which includes all the security defects, re-architecturing needed, and so forth. Does anyone have a friend that can resonate with some, at least some elements of the story? Could you just raise your hand, right? All of them, <laughs> right? So the good news, or you know, you know, good bad news, is that you're not alone, right? I mean, I think we now have a better idea of what you know the symptomology that causes this. But of course, right? You know, this is OWASP, right? There's one other very important constituency, which is infosec, and I think there's no constituency that's more harmed by this downward spiral than infosec because it means that by the time we get to the buffet table, the buffet table has been emptied, right? There are no budget. There's no resources, there's no cycles left over, you know, to fix and remediate all the defects that we found, right? And that means that we as a community are working on the lowest nutritional value work there is, which is compliance work, right? We're not even helping the organization really achieve its goals. At this point, we're just trying to keep the auditors away. So this is what I believe leads to a sense of hopelessness and despair, right? A sense that we are trapped in a system, right, that preordains failure and we are powerless to change the outcomes. <coughs> so Josh Corman, um, good friend of all of ours, you know, he did a study of burnout in InfoSec, and he found that bur the rates of burnout in InfoSec is off the charts. It's higher than uh, first responders. It's higher than um, physicians in the ER, people doing multiple tours of duty in the military. <coughs> and the three signs of, of burnout are fatigue, cynicism, right? Cynicism is often our core competency. And then... Um, <coughs> The third one is illusions of self-efficacy, right? We think we're better than we are. And I think if we were to repeat the study with operations people, we'd find the same phenomena, right? Why? Because whenever we are put into a situation where we have to live with the downstream consequences of decisions made way upstream and live with them on a daily basis, you know, that's what, you know, it's the most damaging thing we can do to another human being, right? Deprive them of the, their ability to change their own outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me? Mm. All right. Uh, thank you. So this downward spiral happens everywhere. So what I want to do in um, 
three slides is, you know, share with you, I think, the, the reasons why this happens to all of us. Um, you know, independent financial, uh, of industry vertical, industry independent of company size, profit, not for profit, et cetera. And then share with you why organizations like, you know, Google, Amazon, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, Etsy, you know, these organizations that are implementing DevOps have really shown us a way out. So uh, why does this happen everywhere? The first is that every organization almost as a byproduct of how we're configured uh, creates what you know, Dr. Goldratt uh, called in the 1980s a core chronic conflict. <coughs> in other words, every organization has to do two simultaneous things. We have to respond more quickly to urgent business needs, which means, you know, ship more features faster than ever. Right? That's what the head of development might say. And then, but on the other hand, we have to provide reliable, stable, secure service to the customer. Right? And that's, you know, the head of operations would often say, over my dead body. And by the way, maybe even the security person will say, and I'll, I'll jump in too. Right? And what I've learned in my um, uh, journey is that, you know, that can quickly be arranged. Right? Time to market will always trump you know, availability, paying down technical debt, and so forth. And I think that's just a fact of life. But you know, it does explain you know, why the conflict. The second is, you know, why is it every company? Why is it, you know, only Google, um, Amazon, and so forth? And I think these numbers show why, is that every company is actually an IT company, regardless of what business we think we're in, right? 95% of capital projects have an IT component. You can't make a business decision without re resulting at least in one IT change. Secondly, 50% of all capital spending is technology-related. So I guess, in my mind, right, you know, we all know that, you know, Technology runs the back office, right? There's a nervous system of the company. But if you look at these numbers, you know, I think it's easy to see that it's actually the majority of the muscle mass as well, right? And I think the visceral proof point of this is that whenever the organization says, here's where we are and here's where we need to be, who's in the way? Who is conspiring to prevent the ultimate dreams and aspirations of the organization, right, from happening? Who is conspiring to constipate the flow of work, right, making sure that, you know, the organization can never do what it actually wants to do? It's IT, right? And... If you are, you know, if you drill into the IT box, especially when you have multiple dev groups feeding into one shared IT operations group that's a shared service, the bottleneck is operations. And I think that's a very vulnerable and uncomfortable place to be, even sometimes more uncomfortable than information security. So, you know, Act 3, there must be a better way. You know, uh, I think what organizations... Um, like Google, Amazon, Twitter, and so forth, have shown demonstrably is that there is a way to break this core chronic conflict. These are organizations that are you know, doing a very high rate of change while preserving world-class reliability, stability, security, and so forth. So, you know, <clears throat> I think when historians look back around this time period, plus or minus three years, um, you know, they're going to say that something transformative happened, right? The way we worked, right, changed. And so I think you know, uh, Lean will be a part of it, Agile will be a part of it, Cloud will be a part of it. But you know, I think the, the dominant factor will be DevOps. And then if we look for the seminal DevOps moment, they're all going to point to this presentation, which was given at the Velocity Conference in 2009. And so uh, here's where organizations, where the unicorns go, right? Google, Amazon, they all share, share their biggest you know, ops and engineering uh, problems. And so the presentation that was given was 10 deploys a day you know, at Flickr. <clears throat> and... You know, by all first-hand accounts, I was, there, I was not there that year, but I was there the year after. Everyone who was there in that presentation said they knew they were in the presence of something historically significant, right? And so had I been there, I think I would have been like maybe a lot of you, right? It would have, my reaction would have been like, what? Ten deploys a day? They're lying, right? Yeah, that's impossible, right? Um, and even if it were possible, why, what sort of morons would actually want to do ten deploys a day? It's irresponsible, reckless, and I'm guessing probably immoral, right? Because you know, it's just not right. Once a year is about the right number. So, you know, essentially what uh, Allspaw and Hammond, oh, by the way, who are Allspaw and Hammond? Allspaw was, uh, John Allspaw was the VP of operations at Flickr. John Alls and uh, Paul Hammond was the, v was the director of engineering at Yahoo. And so essentially what they were saying is that, you know, dev and ops are very different, right? You know, you got uh, dev is uh, embodied by Spock, right? He gets to sit on the bridge. Captain Kirk actually asks him questions, actually listens to the answers, right? Um, ops is in the, uh, embodied by Scotty. He never gets invited to the meetings, right? Unless, if, you know, there's a several outage and the warp engines are down, right? And, you know, if I were Scotty, right, I, you know, I'd be like, I'd be roll my eyes and say, what do you expect, right? We've deferred planned maintenance for two years, right? This is what happens. You know, I'm out of here. But no, he saves the day. Information security, you know, we are probably like these people, right? You know, when we enter into a third year of a repeat audit finding, you know, who do we need to throw under the bus? 
you know, security management, right? Um, so, but I think what attracted me so much about the DevOps community is that fundamentally it is, you know, look at its name, it's a community of boundary spanners. They said we need ops people who can think like devs, dev who, devs who can think like ops, right? And, you know, just to show you how deeply rooted this is, uh, also at the Velocity Conference, a gentleman named Theo Schlossnagel said, you know, yeah, this is creates a nice summer of love, but DevOps is actually a terrible name. It's incomplete, prone to misinterpretation, because in his mind, it should be called Star Ops, or maybe more pedantically, Dot Star Ops, right? Because, or, you know, maybe more pedantically, every department ops, because in his talk, you can actually hear him say, where's information security? Where's QA? Where's, uh, you know, where's the DBAs? Where's network engineering? Because you need that whole tribe, right? You need all those disciplines to really sustain high fasts of flow of work and uh, stability. So, you know, uh, in my mind, right, I think every once in a while you see a presentation that changes your world. And when I had the, you know, uh, privilege of watching um, Justin, Neil, and Alex talk. I mean, it was, in my mind, it was like, ah, they've just crystallized where security fits in. And not only how InfoSec can be uh, treated with open arms by DevOps, but what exactly is the contribution that InfoSec can provide DevOps that will result in you know, the ideal reaction of, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you were part of this project. I'm so glad you were part of this team. So um, I'm going to go in the uh, remainder of the presentation sharing with you more practices and patterns. Um, and is Neil, is uh, Nick Galbraith here by any chance? Oh, man, you, there are so many smart people in this conference. I'm just so excited to be here. Anyway, so one of the things I learned studying high performers uh, with the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University is that in every field, high performers exist and high performers accelerate away from the herd. And so this is absolutely happening in a DevOps space as well. In, in 2009, we thought 10 deploys a day was fast. These days, you know, that is you know, merely average. Amazon has gone on record um, as of a year and a half ago saying that they are now routinely doing one deploy every 11.6 seconds, right? And so what is a deploy? It could be a feature being rolled out behind an A-B test, you know, behind a uh, uh, t feature toggle. It could be 10,000 new environments coming up. Uh, it could be a configuration change. Um, you know, all of that would count as one deploy. So, um, you know, I think the rate of change is breathtaking. I, this is why I believe that, you know, for any dev test, ops, security person, we all have to learn to work in you know, this type of work pattern because the competitive advantage it brings to the businesses that we serve is so great. Why? I, I think it's, uh, well, I'll tell you more why. So it's not just the unicorns, right? It's not just these organizations. You know, it's also the horses too. And one of my favorite little pithy quotes was, um, if there's anything that horses hate, horses being enterprise IT organization, non-unicorns, horses hate hearing stories about unicorns, right? Because even though one can argue they're actually in the same species or genus, right? Um, and you, if you take a look at the rates of adoption by horses, I mean, it's astonishing. It's financial services, it's retailers, it's higher education, it's governments. And so the question is why? Why are they doing this? And I think the reason is that the, the value to the organization is even bigger than we thought. So um, about a year and a half ago, uh, the folks at Puppet Labs, a configuration management vendor, they reached out and said, hey, can you help you know, craft our DevOps survey of practice? And it was an opportunity to benchmark over 4,000 organizations you know, to really determine what you know, the health and habits of uh, you know, organizations doing at the various stages of DevOps interest and adoption. And we found that there were, there were three big surprises. The first was that the, that the high performers exist and they are massively outperforming the non-high performing peers. They were doing 30 times more frequent deployments and they did them 8,000 times more quickly. In other words, you know, if you take the amount of time it goes from code committed to test environment set up, test running, test accepted, deployment started, deployment ended, running in production, they could complete it in minutes or hours, whereas lower performers took months, you know, weeks, months, or quarters, right? Um, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't help that, you know, it takes 42 weeks to get a, you know, uh, security test, right? That, uh, you know, doesn't contribute to the, you know, great lead times. Uh, but so whenever, they're, not, they're not only doing more work, they're actually getting far better outcomes. They have twice the change success rate, right? Um, so it's twice as likely to succeed without causing a service impairment, service down, or security incident. And when things do blow up, because Murphy does exist, they can fix it 12 times faster, right? So in our minds, this is just the first concrete empirical evidence that you can actually be more agile and more reliable at the same time. In fact, you know, the two go hand in hand. You need both. Uh, how am I doing here so far? I mean, uh, do you think that this is relevant to you? I just want to confirm. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, do you mind if I ask why? 
Makes you feel better. Why? <laughs> uh, uh, right, right, right. It's pure, status quo preordains failure. It's not your fault. It's not our fault. Okay, so why is this so important? It's because uh, you know of things like this. Scott Cook was the founder of Intuit, and when I first found this quote, I, you know, uh, I fell out of my chair, and then I thought these guys are morons, right? So he's a found, uh, he said for the peak season at, in TurboTax, they did 165 production changes during the peak tax filing season, right? And so my first reaction was like, yeah, these guys are idiots. Why would they do that? Because the way I was trained in retail, we were so afraid of the holiday outage, we had a change freeze from October 1 to January 30th, right? So why would these guys, you know, do something that looks so reckless. It's because of this point right here. By doing A-B testing and making change, you know, experimenting constantly in production, they were able to increase the conversion of the website you know, by 50%. Right? So had they waited until April 16th, right, it would have been too late. They would have already lost the prospect of the customer, maybe never to return. So I think you know, our goal as information security practitioners is to show, hey, dev, ops, test, there's a better way to do work. And the value uh, to the organization is incalculable. And incidentally, this sets up the work patterns so that we can actually succeed as opposed to preordained failure. All right. So um, you know, if there's anything that horses are good at, horses are also good at coming with, up with excuses about why they can't be unicorns. So one of the most interesting case studies I ran into last year was from Darren Haig. He is an um, operations architect at SAP. He runs the internal SAP instance at SAP. And he, gave, uh, he showed how he decreased the lead time of code commit to ro- code running and production from nine months to one week. So if there's any application that has been specifically engineered not to be agile, right, I submit to you SAP. I mean, I can't think of another application that is more cumbersome to change, right? Um, and yet, if you can do it for SAP, right, it shows that you can actually do it for BEA WebLogic. You can do it with, with, with WebSphere. You can do it with even COBOL mainframe apps, right? So, you know, it shows that you don't have to be Twitter. You don't have to be running open source software. You can even do it with, you know, software that's been around for decades. So, um, if there's one book I would recommend to everybody, it would be this book, The Goal, uh, that was written by Dr. Eliyahu Goldratt during the 1980s. And he is credited for changing how a oh, generation of managers, how we thought about operating plants. And so uh, this is now integrated into almost every MBA curriculum. And you know, it's a novel about a plant manager who has to fix his cost and due date issues in 90 days. Otherwise, they shut the plant down. And so when I read this book 15 years ago, I mean, it changed my life. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind, even though I had never worked in a plant or certainly managed a plant, uh, you know, uh, that you know, the lessons in the book were relevant to us, right? whether it was security, ops, or development. And so for a decade, we've been trying to you know, write the goal for IT, and that's what the Phoenix Project uh, is. And so you know, there are many similarities between the goal and the Phoenix Project. That's not you know, coincidental. We studied this book for over a decade, getting ready to write the book. Uh, but one of the things that they do have in common is this Yoda, Mr. Miyagi-like character that speaks in kind of enigmatic, you know, cryptic ways that are difficult to understand. And so... Um, our Yoda speaks in the language of the three ways. And so what I want to do uh, is just share with you the principles that underpin DevOps, right? So the three ways, uh, by, you know, I think we should be able to derive all the patterns that um, you know, we observe in DevOps organizations. So I'm going to share with you the principles and then specific concrete patterns. Uh, and I'm hoping, I'll be honest, I've deleted a bunch of the security slides because I want to give you as much ammo as possible to bring to the rest of your organization. Um, So, you know, the first way we have to understand the flow of work as we go from left to right, from dev to ops, right? And, you know, the goal is always to increase flow. If you listen to lean practitioners or Six Sigma folks, you know, flow is a word that they use. And so in um, lean, uh, in, in the DevOps community, kind of our favorite metric that we brag about is deploys per day. But in the lean community, the metric they care most about is lead time, right? The, the, uh, there's a deeply held belief in lean that the, Lean, that um, lead time is the best predictor of quality, of customer satisfaction, and employee happiness, right? And so they, the only thing they care about is lead time. So in manufacturing, it's measured uh, by how long does it take to go from raw materials from one end of the plant to finished goods at the other. And so in my kind of myopic world, right, in the DevOps value stream, it's about code commit to running in production, right? Of course, testing and security is part of that. Um, and we can never get fast flow if we are consciously passing defects downstream. You know, we can't optimize for dev metrics or test metrics or ops metrics, security metrics. You know, we have to sort of care about what helps the organization. And that's when we will have achieved what Deming would call profound appreciation of the system. So I had mentioned deploys per day versus lead time. And I think just kind of as a little um, uh, mini benchmark, 
Think of a friend who's associated with an application deployment. Uh, how many people here, here uh, for that friend would say lead time is measured in minutes? Raise your hand. Nice. Um, hours? Days? Weeks? Months? Quarters? Quarters is not unheard of, right? Um, and by the way, uh, if you have lead time measured in quarters, often it's you know blocked on operations because you know it takes 42 weeks to get a test environment, right? And so I used to believe that developers didn't like testing code. I mean that could only, that was the only explanation I could come up with. But say after observing kind of the quality of releases coming out, but it turns out that you know developers do want to test their code, and they're so desperate to code that uh, to test their code that you know they'll just go to someone who has a reputation of being able to get an environment, get an environment, right? You just never want to ask where did it come from because you know somewhere someone's missing a server, right? So, um, so, um, so I think lead time, right? Great predictor of quality, uh, customer satisfaction, and uh, employee happiness. I think it's also a great indicator and predictor of cultural trust between ops and dev, and unfortunately, information security as well, right? If information security has a reputation of, you know, uh, being, creating a um, bureaucracy that sucks to will, to live out of everybody we touch, right? Um, you know, focusing on technical minutia, right? Coming up with every reason to say no, right? You know, we're, you know that's going to be another one. Um, but, you know, it's not only a predictor of cultural distrust and animosity between those different uh, groups. It is also a good predictor of catastrophic deployments. And so we believe that one of the main reasons for catastrophic, world-class deployment failures, right, is that the first time the code is being integrated in a production-like environment was during the deploy, right? In other words, the first time that anyone actually bothered to run it on a secure configuration that actually you know can withstand you know production um, like load is you know during the deployment, and of course nothing works. So if this is the case, you know, then the countermeasure really is, and the a behavior we observe in high performers is that operations must be must enable anyone to get an environment that resembles production with a click of a button, right? To spin a new instance up, to create a new VM, whatever, right? Uh, and so that anyone who wants one can get one without opening a ticket, without going through a security checklist, right? They can get it when they need it. And there's a common build mechanism that builds the dev, test, and production environments all at the same time. So, uh, you know, I think that one of the best uses of this um, is you know giving this to developers so that even in the earliest stages of the project they can actually be writing, running, and testing the code in a production-like environment. So I will say this: I actually thought about ten, uh, you know, eight years ago when I saw Agile being rolled out in financial services, I thought it was morally wrong, right? I thought that it was gave developers an excuse to ship crappier code more frequently, you know, of which we downstream would have to clean up and live with forever. And yet, you know, I genuinely believe now that, you know, they have so much right. You know, they talked about small batch sizes, you know, ship more frequently, sh uh, small development intervals. I just wish we could go back in time and add one clause to their definition of done. It is not sufficient to have working and shippable code at the end of each development interval, right? It should be demonstrated in a production-like environment. And by doing that, it means that even at the earliest stages of product, project, you know, we will have integrated the code in the environment and that has some shot of being secure, right? tens of times, and certainly by the end of the project, you know, that will, integration and testing will have happened thousands of times, which massively reduces the deployment risk. Uh, how am I doing here so far? So far so good? Okay. Um, and just because I'm paranoid, does this seem relevant for InfoSec? Mildly? Or yes? Okay, good. All right, awesome. So let me give you another uh, pattern, is we have to deploy smaller changes more frequently. One of the biggest sort of aha moments I had in my journey um, was the Facebook chat story. So this happened in 2008. If you look at how they shipped chat, I mean, it was, uh, in my mind, like nothing I'd ever heard of before. And by the way, my first reaction when I heard the story was that, you know, I rolled my eyes. I'm like, chat? I wrote one of those, you know, as a you know, sophomore in you know, college, right? You know, it's a trivial problem. But across 100 million users as an order N cube problem, right? Very difficult. It was their first, it was one of the largest initiatives they had undertaken. It was their first use of Erlang in production, right? It, was, it took a year. And so what was interesting was that for every, every day during you know, most of the project, they were deploying code into production, right? In a disabled state, hidden behind a feature toggle, right? So that the only people who could see it are, were internal Facebook employees. Moreover... They were actually using every Facebook browser chat, you know, every Facebook session 
as a test harness. It was invisibly sending chat messages to the backend servers, right? And you know, occasionally, you know, testing for replies. So this means they were actually had a year to test in production, right? Uh, test in production, amazing, right? Um, I, I used to think that was a joke. No, it, what a great thing, right? So when it came time to release and launch Facebook to the world, right? Uh, overnight, 97 million users came on board, right? Why did it go so seamlessly and brilliantly? Because they had a year to prepare for it. So I think you know the goal here is the win for security is that by doing, by deploying it to production, we can actually test in production in a way that doesn't have to cause disruption for the customer. Um, I mean, how many people think that's amazing, right? Uh, I mean, I, that blew me away. By the way, there's another thing that happens here. It means that we can free ourselves from the learned behavior that deployments and releases hurt, right? We can deploy in the middle of the day like normal human beings, right? And that means we don't have to work all weekend uh, at the expense of everyone around us. So uh, an important part of this is decoupling deployments from features. Deployments is the promotion of code into production, often in a disabled state. Release is a marketing event. So our job as ops and engineering and security is to make sure that we can deploy into production safely, right? Marketing's job is making sure that the feature actually desire, you know, achieve the desired business outcome, right? And hold them accountable for was it worth building. So um, <coughs> there's one other thing that I found astonishing. And maybe you've seen this before, but I mean, I didn't see this until last week. A friend of mine, he sent me an experiment. They actually did an experiment for this large um, uh, printing company. They halved the, re the release. In other words, they took the release interval and, and chopped it by half. In other words, fewer number of features, fewer number of code changes, and the number of incidents dropped by half, right? And so it really does show the smaller the unit of change, right, the odds of a higher change success rate and lower mean time to repair. Right, so you know, to deploy more frequently is not wrong. In fact, it is a prerequisite to uh, you know increasing flow and reducing lead time. Um, so, in, as having studied these transformations, I believe there's actually kind of six stages of you know how organizations go from horse to to unicorn. In fact, almost all the unicorns went through a very similar thing that looks just like the disease that horses have. You know, um, the first ball in the goal. There's this wonderful phrase. You know, in any flow of work, there's only one bottleneck. And any improvement not made at the bottleneck is an illusion. So the, his logical proof point of this was, you know, if you improve something after the bottleneck, it will always be starved for work, waiting for work from the bottleneck. If you improve something before the bottleneck, work will just pile up at the bottleneck waiting to be processed, right? And so, you know, here's kind of how the, the constraint, the bottleneck moves in, you know, uh, from horse to unicorn. The first barrier to you know shorter lead times is how long does it take us to get an environment that's stable, secure, that's uh, you know, that we have some degree of mastery over, right? That we can trust in production. And so you know, uh, oh, what, what the DevOps survey of practice showed was that there were two behaviors that every high performer had that none of the low performers had. The two questions that every high performer answered yes to were, I'll just go back, uh, was, do you have all your production artifacts checked into version control? Meaning we can reproduce the production environment just by what's in the, in the uh, source code repository. The second is, do we have an automated code deployment process, right, which includes being able to create environments on demand, right? So if we can spin up environments in an automated way and we can put all our security checklists and hardening guidance into the build mechanism, right, uh, that will break the first bottleneck. The second one is how long does it take to actually execute the code deploy? And, you know, again, the benchmarking showed that, you know, uh, high performers had an automated deployment process. And if it wasn't completely automated, they at least reduced the number of handoffs and they didn't have to wait, you know, four months uh, or a month for a security review. That was baked into the, uh, into the uh, you know, earlier in the life cycle. After that, the uh, bottleneck typically is, you know, how long does it, you know, take to set up the test environment and run the tests. You can't have multiple deploys a day if it takes two weeks to set up the tests, four weeks to run, right? And so, you know, the way you break that bottleneck is you massively paralyze the tests, right? Um, and I'll show you how Google does this later. Um, and then after that, the constraint moves to development and, you know, product management. How many good business ideas can we come up with that we think are good use of the organization's time? Specifically, what is not, and I think that's where it should be. Operations and security sh cannot be the bottleneck of the organization, right? Uh, that's sort of not our job. Our job is to enable fast flow. So, um, and I just want to show you um, kind of what it looks like when uh, you know when you decouple our. Oops, I missed one. So another bo uh, bottleneck that I think you know security practitioners suffer more than I ever thought was 
overly tight architecture. We want to make the change. We want to fix the, the application defect, but we can't because we have to touch 15 other things, right? Because the application is so tightly coupled that um, you know, not only can we not make the change, it turns out 15% of developers' time are in committee meetings trying to get approval by everybody you know, uh, to make the change. You know, the, archi- the architecture committee, the other product teams, you know, the platform committees, the security committee, and so forth. And so the, you know, there you have to decouple the architecture so that you can actually make changes more autonomously without you know, so much planning and uh, process. Uh, am I making sense? Right, and so you know, here's what it looks like. Blackboard learns. Uh, they're a learning management system. Uh, they're a publicly traded company. You know, I got this graph last year. Uh, here's an example of what it looks like when you are bound by architecture. Um, so on this graph on the top is a number of lines in the code repo. The number of uh, lines, this graph on the bottom is the number of code commits. And so uh, David Ashman, the chief architect at Blackboard, said, you know, was get, our code was getting so tightly coupled that we couldn't make as many changes that we wanted to, right? Our developer productivity kept going down um, because 15% of our time was spent coding. The rest was in meetings. And so they uh, said, we've got to fix this, just like Amazon did, just like Google did. And I even thought I heard a uh, talk at Twitter about how they broke the front end up so they didn't have this uh, big monolithic f- uh, front end, although I think it's still there. Anyway, uh, um, and so they built the building blocks, right? So uh, you know, notice that the number of lines in the, of code in the repo actually went down. Where'd it go? It went here, right? Uh, here's the building blocks where every sane developer wanted to work in the building blocks environment, where you could work in your own little module without impacting everybody else so that you could have a whole bunch of autonomous groups working and being productive as opposed to being in meetings, right? Um, okay. So... Outcomes of the first way. We have a single repo for code and environments. We have a deterministic release process that's secure, right, uh, baked into the build mechanism. All the dev, test, and production environments are synchronized, right, um, long before the big deployment starts. Um, you know, we're starting to build the basis of uh, what they call continuous delivery. We're freeing ourselves from this learned behavior that, you know, deployments hurt. And we're shrinking lead times, right? We're going from months to weeks to ideally days uh, to on demand. You know, we're keeping up with the rest of the business. Um, and when we do that, that's how we increase you know, the number of deploys per day. Any questions, comments, concerns before we go to the second way? Awesome. Thumbs up so far? So good? Okay. First way f- uh, is flow from left to right. The second way is feedback from right to left. So the goal of the second way, right, is to... Sh- Take the learnings that can only learn during a production outage, during a service impairment, during a security breach, and feed it to the very beginning of the dev life cycle so that we can ideally prevent it from ever happening again. And if we can't prevent it, at least be able to enable quicker detection and recovery, right? Prevent, detect, correct. And so the principles are we have to respond to the needs of all customers, both internal and external. And so I think we're all good at knowing who the external customer is. You know, it's the person behind the browser, you know, whether it's at home or you know, in our businesses. Uh, but, it's also, but in the lean community, they say the most important customer is not them. It's the internal customer as defined by the next downstream step. Whoever we give our work to, right, that's who we need to be optimizing our work for because you know, it has to be complete, accurate, you know, um, uh, design, everything optimized for them. And we have to shorten and amplify feedback loops. The goal is to make sure, and this is, you know, nowhere is it more important than information security, right? Is that if we see a bad behavior, we want to prevent from happening again in the the future. Otherwise, it's going to happen again and again. And by doing this, this is how we create quality at the source, right? And this is how we achieve this platitude of, like, you know, find defects early. So how does this happen? I think where we look to in manufacturing is a Toyota Andon cord. This is considered the paragon of the shortest feedback loop you can get. And so when I was trained in the Toyota Kata, right, uh, it's really true. You go to any plant modeled after the Toyota production system, on, on the f- top of every work center is this Andon cord. And so if there's a part defective or if the parts aren't there or even if the work instructions, you know, uh, the work is taking longer than documented, you pull the cord. What happens when you pull the cord? it stops the entire assembly line. Literally, trucks stop coming out the other side. Right? Can anyone guess, for a typical Toyota plant, how many times the Andon cord is pulled in a given day? Order of magnitude. Zero, higher, five, higher. 100, higher. It's 3,500. <laughs> wow, right? And so, hey, just to let this sink in, how many times in a given day have you seen something in you know, uh, you know, work being done where you think someone really should pull the Andon cord, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so the question is, why would Toyota do something so disruptive, right? Every time someone pulls a cord, you know, they're stopping the line. 
because it's the only way they have found over decades of experience to maintain uh, a production rate of 2,000 vehicles a day. That's one finished truck going off the line every 55 seconds. So if you don't fix the defect at the work center, if you allow technical debt to accrue downstream, right, it becomes far more expensive, maybe even impossible to fix. Intervention, countermeasure, and on cord. So, um, so what does feedback look like in the DevOps value stream? I think this is one of the best embodiments of this philosophy. Patrick Lightbody, uh, he's the uh, head of marketing now at uh, New Relic, God, amazing vendor. Um, uh, he was the founder of a company called BrowserMob before that. It was one of the first massive load testing tools in the cloud. And he said, we found that when we woke up developers at 2 a.m., defects got fixed faster than ever, right? I was like, wow. <laughs> right? And it's not because he didn't like developers. He wasn't calling random developers at random times, right? He will made sure that there was shared pain because you can't have shared goals unless you've got shared pain. And so one of the hallmarks of dev and ops, DevOps organizations is that developers are put on page rotation just like operations, right? In fact, dev managers are also put on page rotation. And so I think this is a way to make sure that we never have this illusion that we're shipping features achieving the goal when all we're doing is shipping unusable code downstream. So, <clears throat> you know, Werner Vogel, CTO of Amazon, says it even better. You build it, you run it, right? Um, so, you know, uh, so I think, let me share with you a couple of, oh, evidence point. So why would they do this? So Google, you can see this in, a, in the productivity numbers. Google has 15,000 engineers working on 4,000 simultaneous projects. All ch code is checked into one source code repo that I think is like four terabytes. I mean, it's just like huge. Uh, 5,500 code commits a day, each resulting in a production deploy. 75 million test cases run daily. It doesn't hurt that they actually have more servers than God, but you know, uh, that's, you know, why would they do that, right? Because Aaron Massari, part of the uh, SCM team, the tool, dev tooling team at Google says, automated tests transform fear into boredom, right? And so what better ecosystem is there for information security when there's an automated deployment pipeline that makes sure that every time a developer commits code, you know, it runs a test and developers say thank you, right? So uh, how do we get there? Um, let me, 13 minutes. Um, so just to kind of share with you more sort of breathtaking awesomeness of the unicorns, right? This uh, presentation was uh, given by Tom Limoncelli. He's uh, one of the site reliability engineers at Google. And so SREs, they're considered the uh, uber sysadmins at, um, at Google. They're good at ops. They can talk to developers. And he was describing that at Google, they have a policy that says for any new service or application, the developers must self-manage their own code for six months, right? Um, why? Because until they can live with it, why should operations live with it, right? Um, and so they have this thing called a hands-off readiness review where, you know, you have to show that, you know, it can actually run without, you know, people being woken up at 2 a.m. all the time. You know, it looks like a production checklist, but, you know, the resemblance stops there. What happens when uh, something goes into production, you know, passes the HRR, and it goes fragile, right? Because Murphy does exist. They have something called the handback, Right? That essentially is saying, hey, your puppy is cute, beautiful, you know, has tons of business value, lots of potential, but you know, she's pooping on the floor, right? and here's your puppy back. Give it back to me when um, you know, she's house trained, right? and we'll run her through the HRR again. Right? So how many people here would love to have a handback clause? <laughs> right? this, is, this is just not you know, production ready. And I think this really shows the mutual respect between dev and ops. And I think, um, you know, forgive me for belaboring this point, when dev and ops are at odds, information security gets aced out of the game, right? And so when dev and ops are actually working together, you know, creating fast flow and, you know, not blowing up the site every day, right? You know, that creates the conditions where information security can really help, you know, secure the application's data and the organization. Okay, so uh, the handback is a very significant, severe source of feedback, um, type of feedback. Here's another one that's much gentler, but I think uh, far more important and persuasive. This is John Alspa. Uh, he's now the EVP of Tech Ops at Etsy, one of the unicorns. <laughs> Where is that Zane? Wait, did someone say woo? No, right. <laughs> everyone loves Etsy. All right, so you know, he said, you know, we've created a culture where every developer, right, must create production tele telemetry for the features they write. In other words, if it's not, if it's important enough to write. It's important enough to instrument. And so I'm showing this picture not to show John Alspaugh, although he is quite dashing, 
Uh, I'm going to show you what's behind him. They've got on record saying that they have over a quarter million metrics being generated in production all the time. That's f- you know features, application health, database, storage, you know OS, network, firewalls, everything. And <clears throat> and uh, Nick Albrecht right even has a couple of his you know on the big board. And the, you know what they did was they said. You know, they invested so much effort into, you know, tools like Stasty and Graphite where a developer has to add one line of code and bang, right? They have one more, um, you know, graph in production. You know, here's whatever they're trying to instrument and each vertical line is a deploy. And what is astonishing to me is that no developer will do a deploy without staring at these metrics. I mean, people actually look at them, right? When I think about the PCI um, compliance breach studies, right, that why did it take three quarters, you know, to actually detect that we're losing cardholder data. No one was looking at the logs, right? You know, so how amazing is it that, you know, as security, we can actually instrument things and people will actually pay attention. So uh, I submit to you as proof as this. I love touring DevOps organizations and watching them work. So this is Rally Software. They make the uh, agile planning software. It's about a $100 million a year company, publicly traded. This guy's name is, Dr., uh, is uh, Charun Reddy, director of IT Ops. And, you know, so, you know, you can see the, you know, panes of glass behind them, all the production telemetry. This is actually coming out. They feed it into Tableau. They have an ops engineer uh, who's a statistician who feeds it all into R, <laughs> right, because, uh, you know, they care about statistics. They want to find variance early before it causes something catastrophic. So right before I took this picture, someone had whispered to uh, Tarun something like, uh, that the lithium crystals are fluctuating, we're down 30%. Um, you know, what should we do, Captain? And everyone's looking at these metrics going, is this a storage issue or is this a database issue? And I think I actually pissed him off. Right? I, I asked, are we actually watching a SEV1 outage in progress? And he's like, no, 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 we're just, we just saw something flapping and we just want to determine what caused it before it causes something more significant. Right? High performers find variance early before it causes a bigger variance, like a security breach. Um, so, by the way, and so the other eight minutes. Okay, we can do this. Um, so, one of the stories that um, these guys tell is how they refactored and rearchitected their flagship product uh, to reduce the deployment cadence from eight weeks down to two weeks to five minutes. It turns out there was one specific problematic module that it was so tightly coupled that it touched every part of the application uh, that they would decided to refactor first. It turns out that application was the authentication module. Right? <laughs> right? What? Right? I mean, my reaction was like, you're kidding me. You, you guys are idiots, right? I mean, you screw up the authentication module, you could accidentally disclose you know, all your customer data. But apparently, it was so critical, right? Because they wanted to decouple you know, the authentication module from everything else. And I think what I found so astonishing was the care that the developers, the security people, and the ops people took to do this. It took them eight weeks to refactor the module. They decoupled the code and they ran it side by side for a year, making sure that the inputs and the outputs were identical. Then and only then did they cut over to the decoupled module. <laughs> I mean, I actually had tears in my eyes. I was like, I want every security friend I have to know like the care and diligence they took, right? Because developers actually do care about, you know, things that we care about. Does anyone sort of like kind of get excited and Get weepy at that story. <laughs> I, I really do. Um, so, and then, and then we can't forget about the ultimate form of feedback, right? So, the, in 2012, I got to see um, Justin. Could you please stand up, Justin? Because everyone should pet Justin before the day is over. I mean, he is like Justin, Neil Matoddle, and uh, Alex Smolin, um, who apparently is dead now because I haven't seen him in years. Um, you know, they gave this amazing talk that I would put in my mind as a security practitioner up there with the Allspa Hammond presentation because in my mind it showed how everybody's going to be working in 10 years. And so if I may paraphrase the story, uh, you know, he's describing how you know, they were all hired after you know, a rather large security incident happened, which was the President of Barack Obama, uh, the Barack Obama account being hacked, in which uh, the consequence was there was an FTC trade injunction that you know, said, thou shalt have an information security program for the next 25 years. Right? And so their challenge was, how do we affect the daily work of development and operations right? so that we have a prayer of you know, creating a secure code, secure environments, and so forth. And they, they described a whole set of tools, which included you know, SADB, you know, Phantom Gang, but the one that really blew me away was um, Breakman. It's a static code analysis tool that is intended to be used in the daily work of development. So certainly, you know, find defects early when you commit code into production, 
right? So you can find it before the big production deploy. But more importantly, the kind of the ideal use cases, every time a developer hits save, they might get an email saying, hey, we just detected the you know, potential SQL injection vulnerability. Here's how to fix it, right? And then uh, you know, when they fix it and hit save, um, you know, they'll get another congratulations email saying, thank you so much. Thank you for fixing the vulnerability, right? Please rate our feedback. Uh, please rate our advice on a scale of one to five stars, right? And in my mind, you know, that is, in my, in my mind, is, it is like the only way that we can sufficiently change the way um, how code is written in daily operations and the environment as well. Um, Justin, I want to make sure I haven't overstated anything. Um, I know that you might have some caveats on that, but... No, <laughs> it was in the demo video. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bullshit. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, false positive. F you. <laughs> and and th I think it actually floods Neil's inbox with 100,000 emails. <laughs> uh, feedback, right? Feedback is love. So um, I'm going to skip the third way. I just want to share with you one thing that might be my biggest aha moment in the last year, which is that I think the days of determining whether a whether it's safe to make a change or not based on an essay contest that goes into a change management meeting is coming to a close. That instead, you know, it really should be based on, you know, the automated test suite, right? And if something bad happens, in fact, Four minutes. I do want to share with this story because in my mind, I think this is like one of the biggest challenges we have as a community. So I was talking with John Osborne, um Jez Humble. He wrote the Continuous Delivery book. And we were discussing the Knight Capital failure. And it was probably the most traumatic call I've ever had because I was on the brink of existential despair for six weeks because it said that everything I knew was wrong. Right? And, I was, and I'll, I'll tell you what they convinced me of. So the Knight Capital failure was the famous $400 million uh, trading loss right, caused by a deployment error that they couldn't turn off, right? And that the firm actually got liquidated over the weekend, right? Because it actually caused systemic risks to the organization due to a deployment error. So the typical narrative of the failure, of the accident, was that it was a change control failure, which I think is valid, or it was a testing failure, which is also equally valid. But what they convinced me of was that the low trust command and control countermeasures that you would put into place preordain the future likelihood of a future failure. Why? So, one, a change control countermeasure would be you put one more level of signing authority needed you know, to make the change, right? And what they convinced me of was, holy cow, by removing the feedback between the person actually doing the work and the person making the decision increases you know, the chance of a future failure. With me so far? The second piece is by doing more testing, right? Off, especially if it involves more manual testing, it means making changes less frequently, right? Because we have to test more, right? And so we have shown over and over, right, that as the batch size of the change increases, change success rate goes down, mean time to pair goes up, right? And so, what does that mean? <laughs> it means that. that only countermeasure is you have to make changes more frequently with less supervision. And I don't know how you sell that argument to the organizations that we might have screwed before, right? You know, I think what they're going to say is, let me get this right. You made a big mistake that caused something, that caused something catastrophic, and you want to do it more often with less supervision, <laughs> right? Right? Uh, right. <laughs> and yet, there's no doubt in my mind that that is the way to go, right? Because that is what every unicorn has had to go through. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, studying how organizations transform from a low trust organization that's command and control to one that's high trust, you know, I think is going to be one of the bigger management challenges that we have as a community. That's not just infosec; that's operations and development as well. And that's something that we actually put into the um, 2013 uh, DevOps survey of practice. Is you know we're trying to see, confirm the hypothesis that you really do need high trust cultures, right? That don't have approvals. Um, that instead it really rely on the judgment. Just to show you what I think a change management meeting will look like in 10 years, uh, John Alspa, he was describing this uh, ritual. I think Etsy, Facebook, you know, they have this ritual where every junior engineer on their first week of work will do a deploy, right? Uh, and if the deploy fails, they're not going to blame the engineer. They're going to say, oh, wow, <laughs> we should have a test to prevent that from happening. So a junior engineer at Etsy asked John Alspa, is it okay for me, for me to make this change? Right? It was like an HTML change. And his response was, I don't know. Is it? 
<laughs> I was like, wow. And that, in my mind, explained why John Osbaugh has talked more like a philosopher than an ops guy, right? You know, because he's a high trust management style guy. So, um, you know, I think that's another thing that we're going to help, have to help encourage. Um, so, second ways, defect security issues getting faster than ever, uh, more usable stories. Everyone's getting more work done. Everyone's communicating and coordinating better. You know, I'll talk about the third way, about things like Chaos Monkey and so forth, uh, if you really, really want. But let me just tell you why I think this is important. Because the status quo preordains failure. You know, there's a reason why any person who's put decades into their career doing information security, you know, leaves. <laughs> right? Yeah, that we feel, when we feel like it is um, increasingly hopeless, right, and we are powerless to change the outcomes, right, that does damage to us as human beings, right, and that causes damage to us, not just us, but also the people around us. I think about, you know, the days I've woken up and my jaw hurts from clenching my jaw all night because I've had to deal with cleaning up the mess of somebody who didn't know what they was doing, you know, and they made a decision months ago, right? You know, uh, there is a better way, and, you know, I think the DevOps community is showing what that better way looks like, and, right, it is Dev Security Ops, um, how much business value is on the table if we solve this problem? A friend of mine, we did a calculation. He was uh, a co-author. He's a co-author. He, uh, we said, how much business value is there on the table for us to recapture if we could just have the amount of waste in the IT value stream and redeploy it in a way where we could five times the value back? And the number we came up with was $2.6 trillion. Right? So, you know, that's a huge number, right? That's more than the, than the annual economic output of Germany. Right. So imagine being able to re-inject $2.6 trillion into the economy. How many more projects can we fund? What does that do to productivity? What does that do to standards of living? Right? You know, uh, there's no doubt in my mind you know, how DevOps and InfoSec work uh, will unlock the next surge of productivity, the likes of which we have not seen in 30 years when manufacturing was transformed by lean. But in my mind, you know, the way I think about this number is through the eyes of my kids. I have a six-year-old and two identical twin three-year-olds. You put $2.6 trillion back into the economy over two decades. Now you make a material impact on things like you know, health, wealth, and you know, things like world peace right, become possible. So in my mind, you know, there is, you know, this is a problem we're solving. Um, I guess my fondest hope is uh, if I could wave a magic wand is that you know, in the last hour I've convinced you that you – know, Failure is preordained in status quo and that there is a better way. And that I'm hoping that this will generate some ideas of some things they can take back and start some conversations with your dev and ops peers uh, that lead to awesome greatness. So you too can be as great as Neil and Justin. Um, our goal is to positively impact the lives of, of a million IT practitioners by the year 2017. One of the ways we're, that we're doing this is making the first half of the Phoenix Project available uh, for free. So anyone who wants a copy of the book or if you want to give it to somebody, you know, just go to that site. You know, and uh, send the, you know, you'll get a PDF back and s spread it around. Studies have shown over and over that the most effective mode of persuasion is storytelling, right? Whenever the goal is to activate the mirror neurons in someone else, uh, you know, storytelling is the way to do it. And so that's the reason why we wrote the, the Phoenix Project in the form of a novel. And, you know, because, and I'm hoping that by spreading this you know, excerpt around, you will find your fellow travelers who say, yeah, I see this problem, and why don't we work together uh, to actually you know, make it go away and uh, you know, replicate the transformation that every unicorn has gone through. Uh, let me just share you, with you three things I'm working on that if you're interested, just email me. I'm working with uh, the se a, um, a senior manager, Ernst & Young, um, because we believe that one of the biggest impediments to DevOps adoption are the auditors. Nothing will freak out auditors more than seeing devs do their own deploys, right? And without change approvals, right? Forget about it. So what we're trying to do is create a set of worksheets where we can show that, you know, we are actually managing the risks and here's how we evidence it. Um, and, you know, uh, do it with, you know, the firm that actually is the audit firm of record with, of Google, Amazon, Rackspace, so forth. Um, we are hopefully weeks away from having the first draft of the DevOps cookbook that really is meant to be a prescriptive set of steps of how you, you know, rep go from good to great. And if you're interested in uh, seeing an early draft or better yet, you know, scrutinizing and uh, uh, reviewing it, please uh, let me know um, and uh, I'll, we can make that so for you. So that's how to reach me. Thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll see you later tonight. Thank you.